This conference will now be recorded. Well, it's great to be here with everybody today on January 26, 2021. Our guest today is Laura Foster. Um, unfortunately, the Empress of Biz, who is my uh, normal co-host, Joanne Forrester, uh, had an emergency and couldn't join us today. But as we say in show business, the show must go on. And we're very fortunate, again, to have Laura Foster with us. Laura is a leadership coach and a life coach. So, Laura, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun. So my first question is, um, and I know you had a prior career in, in fashion and design, and we'll, we'll talk about all that later, but just to give kind of the, the viewers a, a quick intro, um, what is it exactly that you do and, and kind of what motivated you to uh, pursue this, this line of, of business helping other people? Sure. So I am a life and leadership coach. I mainly work with executives and entrepreneurs who've come to a place of success in their outer world, but feel like there's something missing inside. So I found that when I started working as a coach, when I worked with C-level executives and VPs, when we would talk about what they wanted to create in their future, some of them had no idea. And that was fascinating to me. And so I really love working with people who are thinking about what do I want my legacy to be? Why am I really here? Am I being of service in the world in a way in a way that's really meaningful to me? So that's what I do in the world. And I, you're right, I spent 25 years as a fashion designer, the vast majority of my career. And it's what I wanted to do since I was a little girl in Helena, Montana, making clothes for my dolls. My father did not love his job and I wanted to have a job that I loved. So I made it as a fashion designer, I was traveling to Paris, doing all these incredible things. I got to draw for a living. And I thought it was a dream job for me until I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2007. And that really forced me to slow down and look at my life. And I realized, oh, I work all weekend, every weekend. And this is not what I want on my tombstone. I don't want here lies Laura Foster. She worked weekends. So I had to think about like, is this the life that I want to lead? You know, I was drinking too much. I was taking sleeping pills every night. And this job that I was supposed to fulfill me didn't fully fulfill me because I wasn't filling out the other parts of my life. So that put me on a quest to find what would fulfill me in my life. I ended up in a master's degree program at University of Santa Monica in spiritual psychology, which I never thought would be for me. But Ron Hulnick, who runs that program, said from the front of the room at the informational evening, if you come do this program, in two years, you will have a different job. And I thought, oh, that's useful for me. Because I realized it wasn't just the fact the job wasn't fulfilling me. There are parts of it that I really, really hated, even hated, even though I was supposed to love it. And I can say that that program completely changed my life. Um, it completely changed my relationship with the job that I had at the time. And they had a coaching training program and I went through that and it was really my intention to help other people who were in that place of this isn't working for me and I don't know how to get out of it. So I started taking clients and three years ago I made the leap to be full time in my business and I have not looked back. Well, let me ask you a question because um, in, in one of the... Uh, you, you sent me a statistic in, in one of your emails that was kind of surprising to me to the low side. Yeah. And it was that you said that, I'm, I'm going from memory here, but I think it was 64% of people are not engaged or, or are not happy with their jobs. And and like everything, I'm sure there's like like any relationship, your relationship with your job, your boss, your company, there's, there's ebbs and flows. Um, but I also had a, a very long corporate career. And to be honest with you, I would have guessed that number was a lot higher, more like 80 or 90 or 99% of people. So I'm actually kind of surprised that that even though maybe it's a bad number, it's not as, as high as I would have expected. Well, it's interesting. Gallup runs these polls and it used to be higher. Before the pandemic, it was like 78%, I want to say. And this is a number after the pandemic. So I think part of it has to do with the people who are still working are more grateful for their jobs. 
I don't know what else it could be, but it significantly went down once the pandemic started, which is very curious to me. But you're right, that number usually is in the 70s. Okay. Well, is it could be because people are happier working from home? Is because that be part of it? That could, absolutely, that could be it too. Okay. Um, let me ask you this question um, because you say you work with um, executives and, and leaders to kind of align their their personal goals, their aspirations, their lifestyle. Uh, with their jobs or maybe a new potential job or, you know, that, that they have to get. Uh, my question is, a lot of times those individuals don't operate in a vacuum, meaning they might have a spouse, they may have kids, they may have, you know, even parents now uh, that maybe are used to a certain lifestyle, a certain system, uh, a certain level of income, again, neighborhood cars, you know, this, that, and the other thing. So um, how does that come into play with what you do and and is part of the process to make them supportive of the change or, or how does all that work? Yeah, well, to me, the real opportunity when somebody is disengaged with their work or doesn't like their job is to use that to see what is going on with me in this job, to really take ownership of how am I showing up as a leader in this organization, as an employee in this organization, how, if it's your own company, how am I showing up with my employees? Where am I blaming other people? Where am I not taking responsibility for what's going on? To me, the main opportunity is in cleaning up anything that's going on inside in the way that we're working in the job that we currently have before we make a change to anything else because i've had clients who have come to me hating their jobs hating it there's one in particular that's coming to mind right now i had a conversation with her two weeks ago she loves her job now same job same exact job but she started standing up for herself she started asking for things. She was resentful because she wasn't getting the raises or the bonuses that she wanted. So she stood up and started asking for them. She started asking for the support that she needed and everything changed for her. She didn't, we don't always necessarily need to change jobs. What I think is really fruitful for all of us to consider is to work on ourselves and use work as a catalyst for our personal growth so that whether we stay in a job or move on to something else, that we're moving on from a different level. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. So so let me ask you this, because that, that maybe segues a little bit into, um, are most of the time, are you selected and engaged and paid for by the individual? Or is there instances where maybe you are selected and engaged and paid for by the organization because they recognize that you know there's a certain high level executive that could use the help could use the coaching maybe the organization doesn't have the internal resources to do that but they'd like to keep them they'd like to keep them productive they'd like to keep them happy and so they work with you or, or how does all that work i mainly work one-on-one -on -one with clients that i create myself but i do work through organizations as well and to me, that's going to be something that can really change in this country, where organizations are providing coaching to their employees. Because there is so much evidence, I don't have statistics in front of me, of what a difference getting coaching for your people can make to your bottom line. And the companies that are understanding that and learning that and providing that for their employees have vastly happier employees. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. There's, I don't know that, I know that places like Google, places like that. I, I do coach through Google and a couple of other places, but there's real opportunity for some of these smaller companies to think about bringing in coaches for their employees. That's my, that's my take. Okay. And so now with the coronavirus, by the way, are you doing most of this coaching virtually? Are you still doing face-to-face -face and, and or independent or in addition to what you're doing now, do you foresee it in the future being virtual, being face-to-face, -face, a hybrid? 
Yeah, when I first started out, I saw a few people face to face. I assumed when I started that I would be working with creatives because I worked as a creative for so much of my life. So art directors and architects, and I've definitely worked with some. But as my as my business has evolved, I mainly work with people on the phone. And that was before the pandemic because I work with people all over the world, really. I work with some people on Zoom also, but Zoom fatigue is a real thing. As I'm sure you know, it's hard on me and it's also hard on the people I work with. And I find that when I talk to people on the phone, there's a little bit of distance that can be very helpful for them to have just a little, a little bit of distance, a little autonomy in some ways. And in the future, I see coaching being done virtually like as a mainstay, the main way that coaching is done. There are so many coaches all over the world and there are people who specialize in all sorts of different things. And so it's great that we can look beyond our backyards and get these types of resources. Oh yeah, absolutely. One of the um, silver linings, uh, so to speak, and, and, and I hate to even use that term, but with the coronavirus, um, it's really opened up the scale at, at which people can work. I, I can tell you from my own practice, um, as a business broker, if you were in a major city, there was no problem finding a, a business broker. But if you were in a secondary or, or tertiary city, uh, there may not have been one. And at least now you have access through video chat to the resources and, and you know, you can do 99% of, of what you need to do over video chat and, and email. It's just, uh, and phone calls, it's just getting people to be more accepting that that the work and the the work can be done this way and the relationship can be established this way and that they have you know and letting them think that they have access to these resources that may be geographically far away but may be helpful to them in, in their local environment um, yeah absolutely yeah, let me ask you this because it's, it's interesting. I didn't expect, quite honestly, that that you would tell me that a lot of your work happened over the phone, as as opposed to face to face or, or or now video chat. But do you find, and I don't know uh, how deeply personal and 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 emotional your your conversations get. I, I suspect there's a component to that. So do you find that it's actually better to be on the phone where there's not a face and you're not face to face that that people maybe open up a little bit more because it's on the phone than if it was in person or, or over video chat? Does that actually help your process? Well, it helps me not to be on camera. I will say that because it's distracting to me to be on camera. And I wanna be 100% fully present for my clients. And I also know that it can distract them to be on camera. So the benefit to being on camera is I can see, like physically see when emotion starts to come up in them. And absolutely, I have a master's degree in spiritual psychology. So emotion comes up in a lot of my conversations. But when I'm on the phone, it causes me to listen really deeply. So I have to listen for those little cues and changes of voice. And to me, coaching is about deep listening. So many people are never truly listened to. Whoever they're talking to is thinking about what am I gonna have for dinner or how am I gonna respond to this person? They only take in 20% of verbally what other people say. So the simple act of having a client be fully a listen to like there's nothing else in my world except what that person is saying like I can hear the nuance of emotion I can hear the hesitation in ways that I might not catch if we're face to face on a video call with the distractions of that technology okay and so let's say you you and, and I know every client's unique okay but let's just talk about averages or, or, or typical cases right so you have a client that, that comes to you and, and you start helping them. Is there a point in the process where you say, okay, now, you know, now you're happy in your job, you're doing all the right things. I've, I've helped you and, and this is the end of the road and, and great. Or does it transition maybe to a, to a lower frequency, but there's still some kind of a ongoing coaching forever or so what is kind of the final sort of steady state 
It really depends on the client and what they're looking for. So anyone I work with, we spend, I spend a lot of time in the beginning before I agree to work with anyone really finding out where are they in their life, everything that's going on in every aspect of their life, what are their real challenges, and then we sit down and create a map of what they want to create within the next year, let's say, everything that they would love to create in the next year. And that becomes like a map a roadmap for us towards what we're going to create. And if we get to the point where a lot of those things are created, then it requires another conversation to sit down and say, okay, if you were, if we were going to raise the bar, if we were going to do another round, because I work with people for six months to a year, what would make it worth it to you? What would make you so thrilled to do another engagement that we would want to engage again? And then we would have something else to go towards. You know, therapy is very much about just, emotionally leveling out, working with the past, that kind of thing. But to me, the opportunity in coaching is just always looking forward. It's always, what do we want to create and how can we get there? So that being said, it depends on the client. I have a client who's been with me for three years. I have some clients who every once in a while will come in for three months if they just want a little tune up or just want to work on one particular thing. It really depends on the client. I can tell you that I've had a coach since I've been in this business and I will always have a coach because there's always something to learn about myself. There's always a way that I can grow. Okay, interesting. You know, I want to backtrack a, a little bit to to something that you said because you said that because of your personal background, um, you work more with creative people. Um, and so I'm interpreting, but I, I don't want to be guilty of, of assuming things. Mm -hmm. Is that because creative? So first of all, disclosure, by the way, I'm an engineer uh, by academic background. And, and I believe there, there's, there's a certain level of, of pre-selection there where if you have a, a certain mentality, a certain temperament, a, a certain innate sort of vision of the world and skills, whatever, then you become an engineer. Um, so I, I guess my question is, um, do you think that these creative people maybe think differently than, than somebody else, like an engineer or, or even an average person because they're, they're, they're so creative and do they have unique challenges that, that they have to, to, to deal with and, and that you can help them? And, and so how, how, or, or, you know, and, and so how does all that work? I love this question, Sal, and there's so many questions in your question. So I'll start by saying, I assumed I would work with creatives when I started out, and I did, and I still work with art directors and people like that. But I also started working with C-level executives in tech, vice presidents in tech, people who are so outside of my experience. And that was fascinating to me to start to open them up to, if they were 100% against meditation, what about just spending five minutes in silence with your coffee in the morning? Is that something that you're willing to commit to? And finding that for some of these people, that is not the act of the coffee. It's that I'm willing to give myself five minutes to devote that time to myself. So in the question of do creatives have, like, are they different than the rest of us? I'm going to tell you that my college degree is in mathematics because I was in electrical engineering and then I was in mechanical engineering and then I had so many math credits that I just decided to get out of college and I took a math degree. And so I don't really buy into the belief that, you know, like um, analytical people and creative people are fundamentally different because I think that all of us have both. I have a propensity towards analysis and strategies and I love that because that's my mathematical background, right? And I also worked as a fashion designer. I think everybody has the capacity to be creative. Anything that we create, I mean, we create all the time. You created breakfast for yourself this morning. You didn't maybe go out and get the eggs from the chicken, but you created breakfast for yourself this morning. You created the environment that you're sitting in. You created your business and you continue to create your business. That to me is creativity as well. Okay. So let me put a, a now that you mentioned the uh, the fashion designer work, let me put a little twist on it. Um, if back when you were a fashion designer, you had had a coach like you are now, 
would you have been able to make the adjustments to continue being a fashion designer and 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 like that with with some help from a coach or or would you still have evolved to to being a coach like you are now that's such a great question and we can't know the answer to that question right but if i would have had a coach at certain parts of my career as a designer i'm going to tell you this it would have made my job a lot easier it would have made my interaction with the job a lot easier i spent a lot of years in anguish in the jobs that i'm working because i worked myself into a frenzy for so many reasons one of the things I've discovered from talking to so many creatives after I left that field and went to coaching is that creativity in many ways is not quantifiable in the same way as an accountant works on this many clients in this day and has this amount of work. You know, creativity, one day you might come up with a fabulous design and the next five days, everything's terrible, right? So it's not quantifiable. And so a lot of creatives just keep working and working and working to prove their creative worth and that can be exhausting. It also gets tied into your version of who you are because so many creatives identify with what they do in a very strong way. But if it's not going really well, and if you know the person isn't getting a lot of outside feedback that everything's going well, it can be very challenging. So if I would have had a coach, I'm gonna say within the first 10 years of my career, I may still be in fashion. I may have still been in fashion, 100% absolutely, because I would have likely made some very different choices than the choices I made. I chose to stay with one company for 17 years and pigeonhole myself in a way, in one role, in one segment of the industry. And if I had a coach before I made that decision to stay that long, I would have, I would have made some changes maybe gone to New York, worked for a bigger company, moved into something a little bit different, but we'll never know. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's a, it's a theoretical question. That's, that's backward lookings and, and, uh, yeah. we don't yeah. have a time machine. Um, I think also, and, and, and I don't know how you view this, but, uh, there are certain professions that are more, uh, I will say public, and get more public feedback or, or scrutiny than others. So, for example, if, if you're a fashion designer and, and you know you're making clothes that, that go on the runway, then obviously you know the 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 critics are going to be there. You're going to come out in the newspaper. Sometimes they'll say good things. Sometimes they'll say bad things. Uh, same thing happens if you're an author or an athlete or something. Whereas, to your point, if if you're an accountant. Um, typically, you don't come out in the newspaper and, and you know, typically people don't express an, an opinion on your uh, financial analysis or your reconciliation or whatever. So um, okay. <laughs> I'm sure there, there's a, a, a big sort of a emotional component to the uh, to the uh, public scrutiny that 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 you're held to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's an interesting aspect. Right about how, how we take in that feedback from the outside, how personally we take it, what we make it mean about ourselves and our place in the world. Absolutely. It's a lot to be learned in that. Excellent. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. I've asked you a lot of questions. Um, is there anything else um, that you would like to comment or, or, or point out or, or maybe something that you would like to mention that I didn't cover? Well, yeah, I, I really want to put out, especially now in these times, I mean, we're almost a year into COVID. Some people are out of work. Other people are still working. They don't like their jobs, but they feel like, oh, I should just be thankful to have a job. Like there's so much opportunity right now in these times to slow down and start to ask some of these bigger questions around work. Am I doing work that satisfies me? Is this what I'm meant to do? And if it's not, what steps can I take to start to change? But before I change, what can I still learn in the job that I have if I'm still working? To me, that is such a missed opportunity. A lot of people decide, I don't like my work, so I'm just going to make a change. I mean, for me, I knew that I wanted to make a change. But in the last three years, I learned how to get along with difficult people in my work. I learned how to not take things personally as a creative. I learned how to start to really take ownership of what I was bringing into conversations, into the mood in the room, all of that. 
And that serves me in every aspect of my life. And so my encouragement to people during this time, slow down, look at the work that you're doing and think about how can I take more responsibility here in the work that I'm doing? And how can I start to shift my experience right here? Instead of just blaming, blaming and saying, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. Instead, have, finding some gratitude and seeing the opportunity available. That's what I'm gonna say. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, without obviously going into names or, or something so specific that, that maybe somebody out there could, could pinpoint who we're talking about, can you, th what is the one client that you were able to help the most and, and kind of say, hey, you know, he had this one specific issue or these one, two or three specific issues and 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 we were able to help them and, and now it, it, it looks like this, you know, but thinking of one specific client or situation. Sure. There's one specific client. She owned a chain of casual restaurants in the South and she sort of inherited the business, I'm going to say, in a way, not through family connections, but through investments. And she hated it and she wanted to get out. All she wanted to do was get out, but she would lose a lot of money if she got out. So we started working together and she started making different choices in her business. Uh, we worked together for six months. She saved half a million dollars in her business in that six months, raised her profit margin, raised her employee retention, won a couple of awards in the town that she's in and decided that, you know what, I'm gonna double down and move and, and change my attitude about this and build it into something that I can actually sell. And she's doing that now. She's having a lot more fun. She got rid of some people who weren't working out and the company is gaining in value and she's some incredible things have happened for her since then. I think that she will sell it for a substantial profit. Excellent. Okay. And, um, and maybe one last question. Um, so I know you work with, uh, again, uh, you know, a lot of people in business and executives and, and, and C-suite type people. Um, with those types of clients in, in particular, as an example, how far afield do you go and do you ever recommend them to additional sort of services or counselors or, or institutions? And by that, I mean, for example, you know, sometimes you may start your your coaching from from a business perspective and how to deal with your boss and the corporate culture and your job role and things like that but as the process continues you discover that which you didn't know at the beginning and then i know i know you do a uh an interview right uh but let's mm -hmm. say down the process you discover that there's a um a substance abuse issue right or you know there's there's uh a spousal issue that that maybe there's there's possibility of a divorce involved or or you know there's some marriage counseling that that needs to be provided or or you know you know mental illness or mental issues so how far afield do you go and when do you say okay now i need to bring somebody else in to help with this particular aspect of the coaching or the development of this individual a hundred percent I am not equipped to deal with substance abuse and some of the and mental, like true mental disorders. That is not my field. I will absolutely recommend someone else to come in and, and deal with those types of situations. To me, coaching is really for people who are pretty stable and looking to get to the next level. Not people who consider themselves broken or something is wrong with me and just wanna get up to normal. Coaching is about I want to create something different in my life and I want some support to get there because I'm not doing it on my own. But absolutely, I have no qualms pulling in somebody else where I'm not an expert. Okay, perfect. Well, listen, one last thing. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll put all of your contact information in, in the description of, of the video. So if, if somebody is maybe listening in their car and, and can't look at the screen and, you know, later, if you want to get a hold of, of Laura, you can you can look in the description of the video. But for people that are listening, maybe on, on a podcast where it's it's pure audio, uh, what is the best way to get a hold of you? Best way to get a hold of me is through my website, laurafostercoaching.com. Very simple. Also, you can find me on Instagram at the same username. Okay, 
Perfect. Well, listen, thank you very much for coming on our show. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, taking some time to to share with us, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. and And thank you for um, taking time to improve the lives of of so many people. Because I'll mm -hmm. I'll be the first one to tell you, God only knows all of us that that have these big corporate roles, these big job responsibilities. Sometimes we need the coaching, we need the help. You know, sometimes we have the stress or or the anxiety, or, or just need a, a an independent sounding board. So uh, thank you very much for, for doing that for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to be on. Thank you.